and welcome to the Massachusetts Institute of Technology's System Design and Management Programs webinar series. My name is Lois Slavin. I'm the SDM Communications Director and Convener for the series. I'm here with our technical guru, Stephen DeRocher, and uh, very pleased to welcome you all. For those of us who are, for, excuse me, for those of you who are new to our series, just a quick note to let you know that um, the, the purpose of this series is to present research and real life experience in applying systems thinking to complex challenges. Today we're very pleased to host SDM alumnus Deep Bhattarjarji, so I'm sorry if I've mispronounced that deep, who will be speaking on designing private clouds by leveraging systems thinking. A couple of items before he starts. First of all, if there will be a Q&A after the presentation. If any questions arise while Deep is presenting, please enter them directly into the chat section addressed to everyone. Secondly, uh, the webinar recording and slides will be made available in a week, and we will be sending a link to everyone who has registered. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Deep. Uh, thank you, Louis. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, folks, uh, depending on where you are. Uh, yeah, okay. So, uh, I've been working in management software and things like that for almost you know, 15, 20 years now. And when Lewis presented this opportunity to talk about you know, something that where we applied systems thinking, I thought it might be interesting to talk about the work that we're doing right now. So hence this presentation. So uh, I am not entirely familiar with you know the, the background of everybody who's joined this conversation, uh, this, this webinar. So I'll talk a little bit about you know the kind of the one on one, the basics, and if, if you get bored, I'm sorry. Uh, then we'll talk about the the evolution of how software has kind of evolved over the last uh, five seven years, and then you know how how traditional private clouds look like, and then and we tried an alternative approach that people seem to like, and we'll talk about that, and then we'll take a Q and A. We'll do Q and A. Uh, so a little bit about me. Uh, I worked at Sun Microsystems for a very long time, about ten years. Um, then in between, I you know, did the SDM program, and that's when I kind of moved from an engineer to a product manager. So in that way, SDM had a pretty profound impact on my life. Um, and then you know, I was at VMware, kind of leading the effort for the, the vCenter, their, their main uh, server uh, kind of virtualization management software. Uh, I was briefly at Ubuntu, where I was heading up their cloud uh, product management. And then for the last, uh, I'd say, almost year and a half, I've been a zero stack part of the founding team with four people who kind of started this whole uh, the zero stack, uh, the company, the project. And uh, why am I kind of why do I think I might be you know somewhat qualified to talk about uh, you know cloud and 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 IT and all of that stuff? Uh, right from the beginning, from my days at Sun, I've been writing uh, what they call you know management software, software that manages things like. You know, large storage systems, large uh, you know compute farms, and things like that, and and those are essentially precursors to what are clouds today. And so we'll spend some time talking about those. So um, before we talk about you know private cloud in general, let's talk about you know, infrastructure, IT infrastructure, and, and what it is all about. Uh, so if you work at a company, and all of you you know we all work in some company, some enterprise. You know, when the day we join, we are given a laptop, and it's configured for us, and things like that. Uh, and that's not IT in itself. But the moment you kind of you know, connect it to the wireless uh, system in your company, you know, you're beginning to kind of interact with the IT infrastructure. There is something that powers that entire wireless network. And then, you know, all of, when you log into that system, all those users are managed somewhere. Uh, all of those documents that you write, you know, they're kind of managed by some sort of SharePoint or, or Google Drive or Dropbox or what have you. Right? 
Um, and then as you, as you go about your daily work and you know, all of those, the project management stuff, there is software, pretty complex software that kind of does all of that. That needs to run somewhere. You know, you find bugs and, and tickets and things like that. All of that needs to run somewhere. And then, you know, lots of companies have many employees who need to answer phone calls sitting in front of a computer and they get what is called a virtual desktop as opposed to, you know, a regular thick client like a, like a Mac, right? So that again is powered by some IT, IT infrastructure. So that's on the, you know, as a user, how you're exposed to IT infrastructure. But the, the same IT infrastructure is also used to run, you know, the core business applications of a company, whether that company is building financial software, whether that company, you know, is into retail, all of the, you know, whenever you go buy grocery and anything that, at the counter, there's a lot of software that's, that's powering that system. If you're doing supply chain, you know, chip design, a lot of, uh, you know, simulation work that's done, you need lots of you know, hardware, lots of infrastructure to power that, uh, all the healthcare, on all the biotech, gene sequencing, et cetera. So, as you can see, pretty much, you know, anything that we talk about in enterprise software needs some sort of IT infrastructure. <laughs> So ID infrastructure essentially is, you know, hardware and software that powers your apps. So what does that mean? Right. So you have, you know, server, storage, networking, you know, from multiple vendors. You get some sort of software that manages all of these and exposes, you know, certain simple interfaces. And, you know, you have a variety of companies out there I don't know, you've got these hypervisors, KVM Zen, VMware, you've got cloud management software, you've got containers these days, you know, all those things. Uh, generally, kind of put them under the category of infrastructure software management. And then, you know, you get what is called an operating system, uh, and we're all very familiar with them. We, we have, you know, laptops, desktops that run Windows, uh, Linux, Mac OS, and in those operating systems, the real applications run. So this conversation is about you know, how the, the hardware and the infrastructure software, how they work to kind of deliver that kind of the piece that is referred to as you know, the, the, the infrastructure or, or the cloud. So there are various uh, infrastructure delivery models, actually specifically there's two, right? Uh, first there's the, the public cloud. And we're all quite familiar with you know, companies like uh, Amazon with AWS and, and Microsoft has Azure and Google has Google Compute Engine. And the, the thing about public clouds is it's relatively easy to use. You, you need a credit card, you sign up, and they expose you know, the functionality and you can start creating uh, virtual machines and deploy your applications and things like that. So, so it's very easy to, to get on board. Um, it, from the person who manages all this infrastructure, it's actually very low in terms of operational headaches because that headache is being taken care of by the public cloud vendor. Uh, you can start really small. You need two, two VMs today uh, to, to develop a small app. You can just use two, and then when you deploy it and you need more VMs, you, you can you know, get more. So you pay as you grow. And one other thing that is very important about uh, about public clouds is if you if you if you look at how they make new features available it, almost every 2 3 weeks you'll see an announcement that oh this feature is available or this enhancement has been made etc cetera, etc cetera. so when when services are delivered from a cloud then you get features much quicker than if you were to if those services were kind of you know sold to you the traditional way if you if you install something on your you know on your on your laptop or on the machines that are running in your enterprise you're, you're far less likely to install or upgrade this like every month or, or every two months right so so there's this feature agility that you get from public cloud um, the not so good things about a public cloud is the someone else is running those that infrastructure that they are responsible for the SLA, uh, so you don't have a lot of control. Now, that may be a good thing, that may be bad, depending on you know, your situation. Um, performance, so, so 
we, these are things that we've noticed uh, that sometimes you don't have any control over who is the, who, what else is running in that public cloud. So let's say there is, you know, you're running some stuff and somebody else is running some other uh, VMs next to yours and that VM might be hogging a lot more resources and things like that. Uh, and because there is diminished control, someone else is in control, uh, you know, the notion of enterprises think that, you know, compliance and security may be something that they are not able to, you know, control 100%, so, so that it, it affects it that way. Uh, private cloud. Um, so that's something that, as a customer, you know, you set it up on your own premises and you run it. So. Obviously, since it's under your complete control, you have much greater control. Uh, since you know what are the other workloads that, what are the workloads or what are the applications that are running in that infrastructure, you know, you can guarantee uh, more predictability in, in terms of the performance. And, and given that all of this is running inside your own premises, you'd like to believe it's more secure and compliant. Um, the other side is, you know, some of the bad things, it is quite expensive at the beginning to set this thing up. Uh, the other piece is that it is not just about setting things up, setting up a private cloud. You know, the bigger challenge is to be able to maintain it. So that's where the operational complexity comes in. And that's where you require a lot of specialists. Sometimes you may not be able to hire all of them because they're not all available in the marketplace. You may have to go and get professional services help and things like that. So these are the, you know, the kind of the pros and cons of the two delivery models. So if we are looking to build a private cloud that is better than what it's today, then that private cloud would have the good things, you know, that it has today, and we try to get some of the imbibe some of the good things from a public cloud and try to get rid of some of the bad things that exist in a, in a private cloud today. So that's a goal that we'll talk about later in the slide deck. So another thing that you know, often comes up is, so who are uh, these people who, who build, run, use clouds? And so I call them the, the IT stakeholders. So first of all, you know, in an enterprise, you have a CIO or some, some IT managers, and, and their main job is to deliver business value. So th they want to make sure that their company can uh, create software that makes them stand up, you know, apart. So if, if a company is a supply chain, uh, you know, is a supply chain company, then uh, you know, the CIO's job is to make sure that any supply chain software that this company is creating or, 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 or running runs very well without any hindrances, right? Uh, the, the CIO's job is also to kind of reduce uh, costs, right? Uh, to, they also define, you know, the corporate IT policies, right? Uh, the IT administrator, his, his job is to provision all of these things, right? To, to get the hardware, to get the, the, the various infrastructure software, put them together, uh, to operate it, uh, to enforce all of the policies that have been laid down by the CIO, uh, to make all the users happy, to make the CIO happy, right? Um, the, the user, the guys who actually build and run and deploy these applications. These are from the various business units in this company, right? Uh, they are the IT users. They deploy apps. They are not really very concerned about corporate IT policies and all of that stuff. That, that's BNARX. That what they want is they want their resources now. If I want to spin up a VM now to deploy an app, I should get it right now. Right? So, so these are the three different stakeholders and kind of how they look at the world. So that's kind of a little bit of an introduction. So before we get into the details of the private cloud, let's talk a little bit about how software has evolved over the last, um, you know, five, ten years. So you may have heard this term, pets versus cattle. So what is it? Essentially, you know, if 10 years ago somebody wrote software, whether it was management software or any other software, uh, they followed what was called a scale-up architecture. And what that meant was, let's say, you know, I wrote an application that was running in some 
hardware, some machines, and it was being used by a certain number of users. Suddenly, the number of users shot up because this application was popular. So then I'd have to redeploy this application to a bigger machine or on the same machine, add more memory, CPU, all of that stuff so that my application could support more users. And then down the line, if, if even more users came into the system, I'd have to kind of beef up this machine even more and you know, in order for it to meet the needs of everybody else every user. So the system that was designed in, in a scale-up architecture, what happens is uh, you know, systems are designed to eliminate failure as opposed to handle failure. Right? So the assumption is that this system doesn't fail, that, you know, and it is built into that, that, that software-hardware combination. And sometimes in order to do that, you know, specialized hardware may be needed to kind of you know, enforce such things. And Remember, we said that as users, as the number of users using that application increased, I needed to kind of make run this application on a beefier system. So, you know, at that time, manual intervention is necessary to kind of handle that greater workload. So that's kind of the scale-up architecture. Uh, so, because you know a lot of attention needs to be paid to this architecture, we kind of refer to it as pets. Uh, on the other hand, you know, you have this scale-out architecture where you start running an app on, you know, certain hardware, uh, and as you get more users, you just add, you know, hardware of the same size. Think of them as bricks. Right? You add another brick, and as more users are start using the application, you add more bricks. And so, so you don't have to essentially make changes to the existing brick and make and get a bigger brick you just keep on adding bricks of the same size and they all talk to each other so the system grows with the addition of new resources and as opposed to the scale up architecture here it's designed to handle failure so if any of those machines or, or, or vms or hardware fail it would just be discarded and a new one would be added right uh, and so as a result this requires less human intervention, less maintenance. And this whole process of adding resources can be automated. You know, um, generally there is some sort of a control system that is looking at this and saying, oh, okay, my number of users has gone up from you know, more than thousands, so maybe it's time to add another, uh, another machine to run this application, right? And this, if you notice, fits this whole pay-per-use model very well, uh, which is, you know, if I go to a public cloud and I spin up a single VM and deploy my application, and then tomorrow I, I get, you know, become successful and more users want to use my app, I can spin up a second VM and now two VMs power my app. And then tomorrow, and day after tomorrow, a third VM. And so I can pay only if my application is being used more and more, right? And hence, the term, you know, cloud native is kind of associated with, you know, scale out architecture. Okay. Uh, the other thing that's happened uh, over the last 10 years or so is this whole notion of APIs, that you build a piece of software that does something instead of, you know, exposing all of the complexities of that, you kind of define a set of programmatic interfaces and users just care about that programmatic interface and that programmatic interface is referred to as an API, the application programming interface, right? So pretty much, I mean, more and more software is now being delivered as services that have well-defined APIs. You have companies that have gone IPOs and their job is to take existing software and slap an API on top of it. The companies like Apigee, et cetera. So I'll give you an example. Um, if you are in the if, if you need to kind of send emails to people or, or send you know texts to people, if you, if you if you're writing software that needs to do that, then you know you could use the services of this I, I don't have any affiliation with this company, I just picked its name, you know, SendGrid. They offer email as a service. And they have provided a sort of APIs 
that, that it allows you to, you can call those APIs and send out emails and, and do all kinds of things. And they have very well-defined, you know, set of SLAs. They have a well-defined, you know, kind of cost structure. Up to 40,000 emails a month, you pay 10 bucks. More than that, you pay more. Uh, the other thing that has happened is public clouds uh, have established a dominant design. So essentially everything as a service. So what public clouds have done is they've taken all of this infrastructure, you know, all of the complexities of managing that infrastructure, they've abstracted it out and given you what they call a public cloud with a well-defined set of APIs, right? And these include, you know, and, and they offer you different services. So, so if you want machines, you get compute as a service. If you're looking for storage, you get storage as a service. You, know, you need load balancers, firewalls, all those things. You get you know, network-based services. You want to create you know, an Oracle database or a, or a SQL Server da database or you know, MySQL database. You don't have to you know, kind of install and all of that stuff. You can just, they offer database as a service. Similarly, if you're doing lots of big data analytics to do certain, you know, for, for your business intelligence, you can, you can get that as a service. And then you know the the ultimate is where you know the, the 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 vendor is not only is offering you a piece of software that you can offer as a service. For example, Salesforce offers CRM as a service. And then users pay based on this usage model. So so IT has this has inspired you know um, this is the biggest change that has happened that people saw this in public clouds and like okay, why can't I do this within my enterprise? Why can't my IT provider, my CIO, offer to the business units all of these services and you know, have some sort of chargeback or some sort of showback where the business units pay for the services they consume uh, from, from IT? Right? So that's, that is, is a big shift that has happened. The other big shift that has happened is uh, a lot of things used to be deployed as hardware before. You know, uh, Ten years ago, you know, a firewall would be a hardware appliance. You, you wanted to buy a firewall, someone would, someone would send you a big box uh, with, which has a lot of you know, chips, etc., and software running that is the equivalent of a firewall. Uh, today, you can get a software-defined firewall. You, know, you want a load balancer, it's to be hardware before, now you can get it in purely in so software, you know, routers, networks. So a lot of things, uh, you know, more and more stuff is being delivered as software. So, and that, and, and the reason that's important is, if it is delivered as software, then it's, it, it's relatively easier to, to control if you have, you know, as opposed to controlling too many different types of hardware, and, and we'll go into that. Right. Okay, so, so that was about, you know, things that have changed. So. Let's look at how, you know, despite all of those changes, how are private clouds being built today? So before that, let's look a little bit about, you know, what constitutes a private cloud. And this gets also, you know, I mean, uh, depending on who you ask, you get a different answer as to what is a private cloud uh, or, or what is a cloud really. And so I just thought, you know, we'd put it out here as to generally what people think is, is a cloud, right? Um, so if you look at, I break it out into three pieces. There is the, the core infrastructure piece, you know, the hardware and the basic services that make up the cloud. Right? The hardware, so obviously you have the hardware, you need a hardware manager. You, know, you need some sort of virtualization layer, a, a lot. So back in 2010, uh, Gartner came out with uh, a, a piece of news that uh, more than 50% of the applications running in this world were running on uh, virtual machines as opposed to directly on hardware. So th there is more and more workloads are more and more applications are running in a virtualized environment. So you need a virtualization engine. And these days you may have also heard the term container. So you could replace virtualization with some sort of container you know, engine. So, so virtualization as containers. Uh, I talked about you know delivering all of those things as services, like database as a service and you know, things like that. So you know you have this cloud services management, um, some sort of high the reliability and availability, you know the ability to monitor uh, 
things that the administrator can do uh, you know, in, a, in a simple way that's usually you know, an orchestration engine, things like that. So that's part of the infrastructure. Uh, then you know, on the management side, if so things like, you know, so what is the policy definition? So let's say you, know, you have a, the IT administrator, they're trying to offer services to business units. And some business units need some special, you know, they're running some special application that has some special needs. And if it is, if the IT administrator can offer, you know, a, a specialized set of services, that, you know, that would really be good. So how would he do something like that? He would create some, you know, some policies and things like that that, that, that creates a certain set of SLAs, you know, and things like that. So, so that's one piece on the management side, you know. If you can provide some tools for automation, um, how does an IT administrator know that all his resources are being used up and that he needs to order additional hardware? Or how does he know that the business units are consuming more resources than they should be consuming? So that's some, some sort of a capacity planner, right? How, how, how does the IT, IT administrator know that, you know, what's the, the cost uh, of this entire infrastructure and what's the cost? How can you divvy up the cost among the various teams that are using that infrastructure, some sort of chargeback? And various companies have, you know, multiple data centers or offices across the world um, and where they might deploy their, their infrastructure. So to be able to see all of that on a single pane of glass, you know, that, that's another thing. That, that's another kind of requirement from a management angle. Now, that's on the, the management and the infrastructure is on the side where, you know, somebody's providing the service. To the consumer, they would, you know, the IT consumer, they would need some sort of an API. They would be looking forward to some sort of an app store where they can see, you know, the list of applications that they are that are available to them that they could deploy, run. Uh, they they don't want to uh, file a ticket and wait for two weeks to get a virtual machine or get a container. So, you know, they want self-service. They also want to do automation, things you know, as, as much as possible, as quickly as possible. And they are looking for these various cloud services, right? So when, when, if you are shopping around for a private cloud, uh, you should look at these things, right? These are all of the things that a private cloud should provide. Otherwise, we can't really call it a cloud. Okay. Now, all these components are, you know, Multiple companies could be kind of providing these things. Uh, sometimes a single vendor might be providing all of these things as a suite of different products. Uh, so that's something that you are. Okay. So now the reason we want to build private clouds, you know, better is because we think that they're not built as well these days. Uh, so how are private clouds built uh, today? So the first thing. Uh, you know, a vendor, uh, an enterprise that wants to create a pri private cloud, what do they do? They go and figure out, okay, what kind of hardware do I need? Uh, you know, what kind of soft server, what kind of storage, you know, will it run, you know, my virtualization software, et cetera. Right? So uh, remember on the previous slide, I showed a whole bunch of different components that make up your private cloud. Now, if you kind of make sense of all of that and make it work with the hardware, and then you have to learn how to set this up, how to install, how to configure, do all of that. And that often needs a lot of experts. If either you hire those experts or you, you, know, you get professional services help. And then you finally get to your private cloud. So compared to you know, a public cloud where you just use a credit card and you, you, know, you can create a VM right away. So that's the difference, right? So, and this could take anywhere from one to six months you know, sometimes you, you know, companies I've seen run multiple proof of concepts, and they finally decide to go with one of them. So, so this this can can take a fair amount of time, right? And the, the the longer deployment cycle typically means you know slower time to value. So, because as a company, you are interested in running your business apps because that's where you make your money. Um. The other piece uh, of a private cloud is, you know, you have to get hardware separate, separate hardware for separate things. So there is servers for all your compute stuff. Then you have to get, you know, storage hardware for all your data, 
Then you have to get you know network management, network hardware for all your you know routers and switches and all that stuff. And coupled with each of these different types of hardware is the software that manages them. So that leads to you know complex hardware software integration. Now the other problem that exists is the one of design. So management software, traditionally the way it's worked is you have two sets of machines or two sets of infrastructure. On the left, if you notice, I have you know, this, this controller hardware where all of the management software runs. So you know, the virtualization manager, the cloud services, all of that stuff, they run on the left. And on the right side, these machines are where your applications run. Now this is fundamentally asymmetric. And the reason it's asymmetric is this management software needs a lot, lot of attention because it's, if this management software were to go down, then you cannot deploy new applications. It'll be hard for you to manage these applications and you care about your applications. If tomorrow you decide to run a lot more applications, then you need to go and reconfigure your management software, your controller nodes, to, to, you, know, you need to add more capacity there to be able to run more applications. Right. So as application workloads increase, more controller nodes need to be added. So, and much more operational expertise is needed to kind of manage the system. Uh, the other thing that happens in a traditional private cloud today is everything is running on premise. Now, if you look at you know how the the iPhones or, or the Android phones of today, uh, you know an upgrade or a patch shows up almost every month or every two months, and people don't hesitate to upgrade their or kind of upgrade the software running on their iPhone or their Android phone. Uh, that's because it's very easy to do that. On the other hand, you know, you probably upgrade the software on your laptop a little less frequently, and you upgrade the software on those the IT infrastructure software even less frequently, because, you know, as you go to that higher level of complexity, you know, it takes a lot of time and planning, etc., to upgrade that software. So, so that is one of the things that. If you have software, if you have hardware that's running in your data center and you, know, you want to upgrade it, it is actually far more complex. So as a result, you know, that, that is one of the reasons why someone like Amazon or Salesforce, they can offer new features at a very high frequency and a customer can use it because that customer doesn't need to upgrade their system to be able to use that feature because you know that cloud is running somewhere else you know the, the the vendor is taking care of that new feature automatically so having talked about you know what are some of the kind of the bottlenecks in building a private cloud today let's look at a slightly different approach So you may have heard the term hyperconvergence. Um, essentially, the idea is that instead of having to, you know, look at, you know, separately at storage, at at servers and at networking, if you could converge all of these into the same hardware box, that makes the job of this this whole hardware, you know getting different pieces of hardware to work together, that problem goes away because the, the things that you need to run your IT infrastructure, compute, storage, networking, they are all in the same box and, and they have been built in a way that they just work. You know, the vendor gives you that box with stuff that just works. Right? Uh, and then on top of it, if you add the management software also as part of it, then at least from you know the initial qualification of the hardware and software, that process becomes much simpler. So, so the first, you know, uh, you, you hear a lot of, you know, companies like 
Nutanix, Simplivity, all these companies. They, they, their, their core business, they, what they did was they simplified the hardware. Right? They got compute, storage, everything inside you know, a single uh, system. And these are smaller systems, like small bricks, and they're designed so that as you need more hardware, you just keep adding them and you grow, as opposed to getting one large box and waiting for, you know, to, to kind of grow into that box. The other thing that can be done is not everything needs to be deployed on premise. If the, the less, the fewer things that are deployed on premise, those fewer would be the need to kind of upgrade, patch, maintain them, right? So if you look at what are the important pieces that need to run on premise, you know, one of the disadvantages that we set up a private cloud was that you know customers don't like the fact that their data is living elsewhere. So so customers' workloads and their data needs to run run on premise. So so that one kind of runs on premise, but then all of the other pieces. The, the the management, the monitoring, the, the the way you know the consumption layer, all of those things could could run as essentially on the cloud. So what that does is it secures your workload, it secures your data, but then you know for for, for IT users who want to you know kind of always are in the mood of swiping their credit card and getting access to a VM, you know, they can access resources much faster. So now let's take each of the piece separately, the, the on-premise control plane. Now remember we said that if the design was asymmetric, you know, you kind of have to spend a lot of time you know, manage, managing the control plane. So how, how can we simplify that a little bit? Uh, so if you, if you take the way people build applications these days, uh, what we call the cloud native way, and apply it to management software, then the management software can also be quite, you know, can be made robust and yet simple. So there's no separate controller nodes. You know, it is a distributed control plane. Each host has a controller VM. Each host runs a subset of the management software. And as more hosts are needed, you know, new instances of the services are added. So I'll explain this, you know, in, in the next slide. So the system scales automatically. So let's look at this, right? So let's say you have a bunch of these hyperconverged hosts. In each host, there's a little VM we call the controller VM that is running all of these different cloud software that is needed, right? So the way it works is all of these hosts, they pick a leader. And it's the leader's job to make sure that all of the services are running properly. The leader detects that a certain host has failed, and that host was running these services that are you know, shown in square uh, icon. The leader decides, okay, now what should I do because these services need to run somewhere. So the leader moves these services to other running hosts. Right? So it's healing itself. Right? So the system is designed to handle failure. Now, what if the leader itself failed, right? So every other node in the system that is still alive is constantly monitoring the leader. The leader, if the leader were to fail, they elect a new leader, or the machine with a new green halo around it. And the new leader now looks at, okay, what's the state of the system uh, it, it, from, from a distributed, you know, this is a little complex piece of distributed right ahead logs, right? And, and it finds out what was the state of the system before the previous leader died and starts managing from there. And remember, now it figures out that the previous leader died, so it moves services that were running in that leader, you know, to a new set of hosts and distributes it across hosts. So if I were to have a system of 100 such hyperconverged hosts, then I could potentially tolerate the failure of 97 of them. So when you have a distributed system, you need at least three uh, you know, hosts running 
uh, for, for a quorum so that they can vote and elect leaders and things like that. You need at least three. So, you know, so that's the thing. So, as you can see, the software, we've taken advantage of distributed technologies out here to create a system that is robust and is able to handle the failure of you know, hosts or individual services and things like that. Now, one thing I've not shown in this picture is what if the customer decides that you know, he needs to run more apps, so he needs to add more hosts. Now, in that case, as you add more hosts, the leader will realize that new capacity has been added. Uh, the leader is also able to figure out you know, the volume of calls that are requests that are coming in. And based on that, the leader can create new instances of a service that could run in, in the new hosts. Uh, so that was the part that is running on premise. Right? Uh, the part that is running on the cloud, all of the management pieces, right? So, so as all of these things are happening in, in, in on premise and the customer is, cre you know, the business units are creating their virtual machines, et cetera, uh, you know, little bits of metadata, information about, you know, the VMs, the users, all of that stuff, uh, it bubbles its way up into the SaaS portal, uh, into the SaaS platform. And the SaaS platform, there's a, you know, kind of a big data layer that's crunching all of these numbers. And the result of this is it can provide analytics, it can provide monitoring and troubleshooting information, it can provide information about, you know, you know what kind of capacity is available, how is capacity being used, when will capacity likely end up, you know, end, uh, and what kind of uh, new um, capacity needs to be added. So let's let's take an example, right? Let, you know, let's say the, the, the type of application that are currently running on this private cloud is very uh, memory heavy. And so the capacity planning system will look at it and be able to say that you know, you, you, you'll run out of capacity and most likely you'll run out of capacity because you'll run out of memory. And so the next set of hosts that you add to the system should be more memory heavy than say disk or you know, CPU heavy, right? that sort of thing. And then it also provides the user interface. So you know, the customer would just go to a public website just like they go to aws.amazon.com and kind of configure, uh, consume that cloud. So the benefits of this alternative approach is that, you know, because I've kind of brought, converted the, hard, the multiple hardware pieces into a single host and kind of look at it as a brick and keep on adding bricks as, as a need growth, you know, the process of setting something up is much simpler, much uh, quicker. Right? Uh, so you spend less time on setting up your cloud and more time on kind of enjoying or deploying applications on that cloud. Um, the hardware, the main control plane is still running in, the, in your data center, which means you know, you know, your data, your workload is local, you get better performance, uh, you know, more bang for your buck. Um, the, the design, as I showed, was using the same principles of cloud-native systems. It can grow based on your needs. It's designed to handle failure. It assumes that hosts will fail, you know, network will become, you know, suddenly it will not be available and things like that. And it's secure because the main control plane is on, is on premises. Uh, you cannot, from the cloud layer, reach you know, any of those hosts that are running on your premise. It's the communication is only from on-premise up to the cloud. Okay, so in the summary, this is the new model, essentially, that, we are, that we've kind of built and worked on and we've found it to be useful. Uh, so you get the management, the applications and data are on-premise, user workflows, operations, all that stuff running in the cloud. And this is kind of what we are trying to deliver. So that's all I had, kind of sharing exactly based on the kind of the experience we've had uh, in kind of uh, prior to zero stack and then in zero stack, you know, 
things that we've built and why we've built this stuff. Thank you very much, Deep. Now it's time for Q&A. Just a reminder, if you have any questions, please type them directly into the chat section addressed to everyone. Also, a reminder that the, a link to the slides and to the recording will be sent to everyone who has registered within a week. Um, so the first question is from Sergei Nemirovsky, who asks about the delivery models slide that you showed near the beginning of your presentation, Deep. Um, he asks, what about um, a hybrid, a dedicated slash managed private cloud? Right. Um, yeah, I should have added it, I think, out of, um, yeah. I, I should have added that piece, but so many customers or many enterprises, you know, decide that they're going to go with both, that they have, uh, you know, they need some infrastructure that runs on their premises, and there are certain types of applications that they're happy to run in the cloud, and as a result, they kind of go with both. There is this other scenario where you have, you know, customers that decide that the bulk of their Stuff is going to run on premise, but you know, if they need additional capacity suddenly, then they will burst onto the cloud because you know, uh, elasticity as, as is, is a term that's used in clouds where you know, you whenever you need resources, you get it, but it's on on premise, it's kind of hard to do that, right? Uh, you cannot be infinitely elastic on premise, whereas in a public cloud, no matter you know, they. It is much more elastic than a private cloud. So, yes. Thank you. Um, we still have time for more questions if anybody would like to ask one. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, a question from uh, Nav. Hari Kumar, who asks, why can't public clouds completely disrupt private slash hybrid clouds? Um, apart from the security privacy issues, are there any other issues that would prevent this from happening? Um, you know, maybe 20 years from now, we will say it's all public cloud, but uh, I think the way it is today, based on what's there today, right? Uh, there are many companies where they're not allowed to take any workload outside of their enterprises simply because they want to protect their IP. Uh, there are many companies where they need to run very high performant workloads where the public cloud cannot offer that performance. Uh, many times, so this, you know, it, it is still Guaranteeing a certain SLA is still quite hard. So, you know, if you, we, we often hear stories where somebody needs to create 15, 15 virtual machines and, you know, they spin up 30 to find out the 15 most well performing virtual machines and then they get rid of the other 15. So, so you cannot guarantee that you will get, you know, if you get two virtual machines of the same, you know, size, that they will perform the same. So I think. So some of those problems need to be solved. And, and, and the other problem is I think people still do have a fear, what if my cloud is not available? You know, it's, it's completely out of my control, I think, some of that. Right, so. Okay. Um, we have um, more questions uh, from, and I will uh, give priority to the folks who have not yet asked a question. Um, from Ed Ng, who asks, uh, who says, thank you for sharing cloud-related concepts. Please summarize the key systems thinking concepts that have been included in this presentation. Ah, I knew somebody would ask that. Yeah, so there wasn't a single slide where I kind of showed, uh, you know, the systems thinking. But I think the, 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 key, the key systems thinking is that the, the, the whole system of software, as I said, evolved you know, over the last 10 years where you, one of the main key systems thinking is that 
you know, software should be able to handle failure gracefully, failure of other software, failure of hardware. You know, the second thinking is that uh, not everything, you know, the second thing, you know, the uh, uh, second thinking is that, you know, distributed systems that are distributed, you know, often solve the needs actually in a better way as long as you can guarantee stability of the distributed system. Uh, I think those two would be the, the, the key system, you know, soft, the, the key systems thinking. Uh, the other side, from a business point of view, you know, I'm thinking, you know, what, if, if you look at the stakeholders and what each of them wants. So, so you know, we kind of, we looked at, at SDM, which to talk about systems architecture and all the stakeholders and what do they want, right? Uh, so the, the third key system thinking would be, if you look at the, the different stakeholders and what they want, how has that been solved, you know, in, in this kind of the architecture? Okay. Um, we have a few from uh, Sergey, who asks, um, what is your typical customer profile, size, type of workloads, et cetera? And is there an, an on-premise only option? Yeah, oh, specifically about ZeroStack, um, I mean, we sell to all kinds of customers from very small, uh, mid-sized businesses to, to large enterprises. Uh, we are relatively new, um, so you know, we're still growing it. But, but we sell to all types of customers. Uh, there is no limits on the type of workloads, you know, um, and, and this is a, we're trying to build a private cloud that is slightly different. And so, yes, it is private cloud. But then, as, as we showed, that, you know, the, the way you consume this, that piece is running just like a public cloud would offer. So the infrastructure lives on-premise, but the way you consume it runs uh, in a cloud that is managed by us. Okay. And um, excuse me if you've already answered this question. I'm not very technologically um, educated. Um, Sergey also wanted to know if... ZeroStack is OpenStack based and fully API compliant. Yeah, so we do use a lot of the OpenStack services and it's 100% API compliant. And I think that's one of the advantages, right, you know, that, that it is based on, yeah, it, it is OpenStack. Uh, uh, we use some of the OpenStack services and it's fully uh, API compliant, but then there are a lot of other pieces that we have added, other hardening things that we've done and that has nothing to do with OpenStack. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Deep. This was extremely interesting. And just a reminder, folks, we will be sending out a link to a PDF of the slides and um, the recording. I'd like to invite you all to our next webinar, which will be held in two weeks on March 9th. And the topic will involve a systems-based approach to helping startups look at all of the different um, aspects and life cycles within a company simultaneously. So finance, promotion, customer relations, personnel, et cetera. So uh, the uh, uh, presenter will be SDM alum Betty Saad. And we, you'll receive info um, on it in the follow-up to this webinar. Deep, thank you again, and everyone have a wonderful day. Mm -hmm.